The Voice of Geekdom is now on Patreon. Please check out the link in the description to find out how you could gain access to premium content and social features. Hello Tolkien geeks and welcome back to the Voice of Geekdom podcast. I'm your host Dan and with me today is my good friend Helen, who you all know by now I'm sure. Um, regular guest on the channel. I'm a regular guest on hers. Um, it's Helen the Clueless Fangirl. How are you, Helen? How are you good. doing? Get excited to talk about this topic. Yeah, it's a good one. It's going to be a, a topic of great interest to people in the coming years, I would think. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a character who is in the Lord of the Rings movies, but gets one line uh, <laughs> in the movies. So it's, it's a character that a lot of people know, because uh, it's quite a memorable appearance in a way. But he doesn't get many because lines. of the memes mainly though yeah yeah that's <laughs> <laughs> true <laughs> Isildur! so yeah we're talking about Isildur the um son of Elendil the uh one of the first kings of of Gondor and uh one of the most important characters in the legendarium in a way mm -hmm. um he, he sort of sets up the whole story to the Lord of the Rings um years before the fact um, really interesting character. I think there are, there are different ways to interpret his character and Tolkien gives us different glimpses of him in different texts that kind of sh shine a different light on aspects of him, I think. <laughs> no, and he was actually the first ring bearer. So yeah, where's he... his where's his passage to Valinor, people? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, true. I, well, yeah, the, the, the thing with the ring with Isildur is interesting because, you know, he's, if you read The Lord of the Rings and certainly in the way he's portrayed in the movies, he's portrayed very negatively like it, it mm -hmm. you kind of you feel as though it's a selfish impulse for him to keep the ring um mm -hmm. but then if you look at his whole story and if you look at some of the other sources that we get on him mm -hmm. Tolkien casts a more sympathetic light on him in in various yeah. ways and he's kind of a tragic figure in, in I would argue um mm -hmm. overall when you look at the totality of his story mm -hmm. um he was an immensely brave young man as well and um a noble and, and didn't quite have the wisdom of his father but he was he was definitely one one of on the side of the angels i would say yeah. um what do, what do you like about the character what do you find interesting about him well exactly what you said you know just coming from the lord of the ring movies you have a complete different perception of him but his early days and his beginning in Numenor actually he he was like you said you know he was very brave he did a few things we'll talk about that um in a bit um and you know he is so important to to the legendarium because yes you know you saw Again, men, because you, you think, and that this is what, what always came to my mind first. You think, okay, so these are the good ones now, you know, who left Numenor, who made it out, the nine ships who made it out. So these are again, the promised ones, you know, the faithful. And then he makes, and this is just a few years later, right? He got killed five, five, year five, third age. It's not that yeah, much later right. after the fall or downfall of Numenor, right? Um, and you know he's not strong enough um, to to destroy the ring. And again, we will discuss that. Why not? Um, and I do think he makes a big mistake in not you know giving the ring to his son, for example, but taking it. Uh, we I think we we can read mm. that scene. Maybe I think you said um, you yeah. prepared some passages. And this is really interesting. And I always thought, oh no, but I thought you know they redeemed themselves now, so aren't they? But then again, you know. As another um, character arc, um, yeah, and I find that very fascinating. And he is, yeah, very, very important to the legendarium. Him and his brother, actually. I also like the mm. Anarion story. Maybe we can talk a bit about Anarion um, as well. Yeah, we, we'll talk about various other characters that are yeah. in that sort of circle. So, yeah, his brother's yeah. An, another important one. Um, yeah. A lot of people might not know, actually, the uh, the two statues of the Argonoth are of Isildur and Anarion yeah. in the yeah. books. Um, yeah. In the films, they changed it to Elendil because they kind yeah. of wrote Anarion out of the films. Yeah. Um, and their grandfather. Maybe let's start with their grandfather. Because yeah, so we'll touch on him he? a bit. Amandil, yeah. yeah, he disappears later on in the story. Uh, we're going to go through the complete story, so we'll get there. Yeah. But yeah, he's another one who we'll talk about. We'll talk about a bit of Arthur Arazon as well because you can't not talk about him. 
So I wanted to start with the start. He was he was born in 3209, Isilda. Um, and as we've already said, he had a brother, a younger brother, who was born 10 years later in 3219. I, I usually like to start when I do these character breakdowns with you with a little bit of etymology and try to figure out what the names mean. Um, because this is interesting. Because Isilda um, means servant of the moon in Quenya. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, he was one of the Numenorians, and they all took on Quenya names. Um, and his brother was Anarion, which is son of the sun, kind of, yeah. uh, which is a sort of odd name if you say it in English. But, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, so they have this kind of duality going on with these two brothers, where one of them ha is yeah. associated with the moon, and the other one is associated with the sun. Yeah. Um, and so Isilda later on becomes the lord of Minas Ithil. Mm -hmm. which later on becomes Minas Morgul, we know, yeah. um, which is the Tower of the Moon. Yeah. And so we have this sun and moon imagery going on with these two brothers, um, which mm -hmm. I find really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Moon imagery is, uh, is usually associated in uh, kind of, especially in classical mythological tradition uh, with feminine gods and deities and so on. And um, you can sort of see why as well with the, the tides of the moon and how that's associated with fertility and the menstrual cycle and such. So it, you can kind mm -hmm. of see how that works. Um, mm -hmm. But Tolkien kind of Wait, in contrast in to characters like Artemis and Hecate and, Di and Diana from yeah. Greek and Roman myth, you know, which, you know, but you know this stuff better than I yeah. do. So you know where I'm coming from here. Yeah. Tolkien kind of subverts that a bit, I think, with making the moon associated with Isilda in that way. Um, so how is it with the, when, uh, you know, the Valar created sun and moon from mm. Laurel and, El and Teperian, is that also male and female? Because yeah, we Tilion just know... is the male one and Arian is the female one. Exactly. So it, it switched, right? Um, right. Um, yeah. I, I also do think about Norse mythology a lot with Tolkien. And I think that's, that's helpful here because in Norse mythology, we have a male moon deity called Mani. And oh. Marnie had a brother who was the deity of the sun. He mm -hmm. was associated with the sun. He was he was called Sunna, which you yeah. know the the word sun is you know Germanic, as you know as a German, no doubt. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, exactly. So um, so I think maybe that influenced Tolkien more than the classical tradition did here. Um, yeah, possibly. Yeah. Although, of course, as you say, we've got Tilion and Arian who were male and female, so that was the other yeah. way around there. Although I think it's rather, yeah, it's rather the, the you know, the deities uh, taking care of them who are then chasing each other and in love with each other but can never be together mm. because, yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> the Tilion and, and Arian uh, thing, I had a really great comment when I covered that in my Silmarillion series, actually, that I remember. Yeah. Um, the regular commenter who leaves some quite amusing comments quite regularly, actually. Um, I I mentioned that uh, Tolkien tells us that solar eclipses happen because Tilion um, is sort of in love with Arian and comes close to her from time to time and, okay. yeah. and so on. Yeah. And so the comment read something, a lot, I'm paraphrasing, but it said something like, um, so basically what Tolkien is telling us is that we have solar eclipses because men are clingy AF, <laughs> <laughs> which made me chuckle at the time. Um, it happens. But yeah, I, I happens find that interesting. Things. Obviously, we, with the sword, with uh, the reforged um, Narsil, uh, yeah. Aragorn's uh, Anduril, um, he he has the kind of the symbology of the house of Elendil on it, which yeah. he has the, the seven stars and the crescent moon and the sun. So that yeah. imagery is repeated there as well. Yeah. Um, one final point on this as well. In the Bible, the Virgin Mary is at one point characterized as a woman clothed with the sun and the moon mm. under her feet, which is from the book of Revelation. Um, so that m might have been something else that Tolkien was aware of and that might have been, might have been thinking about with the, the sun, moon symbology. Um, yeah. So I don't have too much more to say about that, but I find that interesting. And it's really cool that he, he picked those names for these characters and associated them with those two towers as well in, uh, in Gondor yeah. there. Yeah. And I love the, you know, the, there's so much fan art out there about how, how it looked. Um, 
And yeah, I'm very excited. And when you then see later, you know, this was the Tower of the Moon and it was supposed to be so beautiful and, you know, like lit in moonlight at certain uh, times. And mm -hmm. then later it becomes literally the Tower of Dark Sorcery, mm -hmm. which is like, yeah, a big, big contrast. But yeah, we'll, we'll talk about why Sauron wanted that specific place because, spoiler, the Palantiri was there. Mm -hmm. stone. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's another topic that we're going to touch on as we go through yeah. the story here. Yeah. Um, good. Actually, I'm going to mention that right now, actually, because um, it's quite a good segue in a way, because uh, at, at the time when Isildur and Anarion were born in their early years, in their adolescence, the king was Tar Palantir. Yes. Who people will obviously recognize the name. Yeah. Um, it, so he was born in Ziladun, which is the Adunaic word uh, yeah. name which is the, the native Numenorean language um, so he was king he was one of the faithful and he's during his reign he tried to kind of rein nice. the Numenoreans back in and try to kind of reboot their whole society towards um, faithfulness to the Valar yeah. and kind of friendship with the Eldar and so on yeah um, so he, he, really was sta very... he really stands out in the, in the history there yes and he was very spooky because you know he made some prophecies <laughs> mm -hmm. it was not just about the palantiri but palantir you know means foresighted right and he made that one uh prophecy um which isildur took to heart <laughs> <laughs> and uh, res rescued something very important then later on yeah but yeah Ta tar palantir is yeah one of my favorite kings and again such a sad story right um, because yeah. what if he would have maybe had a son, a strong son, right? Because he just had Miriel, just one daughter. And we know what happens if there's just one daughter. They always kind of, they're either not fit to rule, not interested to rule, or they, you know, somebody usurps the throne. Um, mm -hmm. And that happened. Um with uh, Faraz on the So what would have happened if he would have had a strong son? Because people's hearts... We're not just, you know, they they didn't lean towards Arfarazon, you know, um, but but they they did because he was a great warrior. He had been very yeah. successful, and but what if the king had a son, and that would, you know be the same for, for the son and people would cherish for him. Um, I don't think Arfarazan could have usurped the throne and the fate of Numenor would have been a different one. So that is very, you know, this is, yeah, it's like make it or break it with this king and sadly, you know, it broke. So to explain that a little bit and unpack that a little bit, we've got um, Tard Palantir was the king. Um, yeah. And then so um, his father was... Um, one of the king's men, and he was one of the worst kings in a yeah. line of kings that got steadily worse yeah. um, before that point. Yeah. But his mother, the, his father's wife, obviously, yeah. um, <laughs> was secretly one of the faithful. Yeah. So it, it, this, he kind of, Arfarazon kind of repeated this in a way because yeah. his his mother, Tar Palantir's mother, um, yeah. whose name I'm not remembering and I don't have in my notes, but. Uh, she was secretly one yeah. of the faithful, and yeah. um, and then so they had two sons. the The younger brother was Gimilcad, who was Arfarazon's dad, and so his loyalty was the uncle's loyalty was to the king's men, and the father was more like the mother. So the mother secretly yeah. taught him to, um, you know, respect the Eldar and and yeah. um, and the Valar. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure, so they, Tolkien tells us that they very often marry into the line of the faithful, but direct into the lords of Andunye. So I'm pretty sure that actually he is also that, that, you know, he married one of, you know, the, the, we don't know how many sis did Amandil maybe have a sister or a cousin or whatever, but I, I think it's pretty close, um, related. That makes sense. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
uh, although I would counter that by saying she was secretly one of the faithful, and if she was one of the lords of Andunio, if she was all that line, would it be secret? I don't know if it would. Be. Well, if you live um, in the king, if you live in the palace at that time, and your your husband is literally one like the second worst king or whatever, um, then obviously you have to be faithful in secret. Mm. So I don't. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I uh, found the name. Sorry, <laughs> because I have a yeah. family chart tree. Um, it's it, Inselbeth. Right, that's it. Yeah. Inselbeth. So he was yeah. Argimilsor, um, so the twenty third ruler, and um, then Palantir was the twenty fourth, and um, Arpharazon, aka Thermiriel, were the twenty fifth rulers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so we're already setting up a tragic background to this whole story. Yeah. Um, this is yeah. just so people understand the context that Isilda came into the world in. Um, yeah. Isilda's father was Elendil. We don't know Isilda's mother, which I, no. find, I find that frustrating. Uh, yeah. I feel like we should know who she is. We should know yeah, more but about her. You have literally such a, like, th there's literally nothing. There is Silmarion, and then there's, mm -hmm. and her husband, forgot his name. Um, Elendil, I think. Yeah, was that, that was the son. That was the son. Yeah, no, I don't yeah. know. I can't remember. Blah blah that blah. Uh, uh, something with A of Andunye, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, Anna, not Anatar, but something <laughs> like that. Anyway, uh, Ilatan of Andunye. Ilatan. Yeah, uh, I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, and then came Valandil, and then big gap, like no one else, because you mm. know, in the chronicles of the kings, uh, he names every king. Um, even in Gondor, you have every king, Anor, Gondor, you have every king named, but not for the Lords of Andunia, which is sad. Yeah, there are big gaps there in the lines of yes. the Lords of Andunia. There are a yeah. few others that we do know, like as you go down, but there's definitely several gaps in between those yeah. as well. Um, yeah. there, I think there are one or two that are mentioned by name in the Akalabeth in the interceding yeah. years in yeah. the, the history, but yeah, um, so it's a state of unrest during Numenor at this time, almost like bordering on violent civil war, to be honest. Yes, um, definitely. And so this rages for, for some years. Um, and then Gimilcad, the father of Farazon, dies mm -hmm. uh, before Tar Palantir in the year 3243. Yeah. Um, and then presumably Farazon takes over leadership of the king's men at this point. Yeah. Um, and then 12 years later, Tar Palantir dies. And as we've already kind of spoiled, our Farazon yeah. seizes the scepter here at this point and takes yeah. over. Marrying um, his cousin, Eek. Marrying his, his first cousin, which is, um, yeah, super ricky. And um, yeah. also, like, unwillingly. I mean, it, it, like, it's not just the, the closeness of them in no. terms of their family, um, but also the fact that she clearly doesn't want to be married to him, at least in the Akalabeth version, which, yeah. you know, is basically sort of rapey. <laughs> yeah, and you see they have no children. So if you're not mm -hmm. blessed with offspring in Tolkien's mythology, so something is uh, is wrong. You see that, you know, with, um, well, one of the last kings of, of Gondor, uh, you see it with uh, Beruthiel, right? They didn't have any mm -hmm. children because she was, a you know, an evil worshipper, Black Nominorian. Um, so yeah, they were not cat people. Cat people. <laughs> uh, yeah, they were not blessed with children. This also tells you, and you know, he was so obsessed with immortality and these kind of people. Yes, they want to have, obviously he wanted to rule forever basically, but still mm. these kind of people, they want, you know, to bring the legacy forth, um, and continue their legacy. So he didn't have any children. I think that tells you a mm. lot about the state of their marriage. Yeah. Very much so. Um, yeah. Yeah, she was unwilling from the start, and I think they got more and more um, antagonistic towards one another as the years raged on. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, actually, to note that in another version of the Akalabeth, uh, there was a draft version that Christopher decided not to go with this version. I assume it was an earlier version. Um, Muriel, uh, is a, there's a less sympathetic version of her uh, where she mm -hmm. had a, an, an Adunayak name, Zimra Hill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she was originally um, supposed to be betrothed to Amandil's brother, um, who was Elentir. So in this version, she actually falls in love with Farazon and chose to break off her, her betrothal and marry our Farazon willingly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then Tolkien changes his mind and decides to make her a more sympathetic, more tragic figure. Yeah. Um, which is, I think is a stronger story. Um, yes. Yeah. 
<laughs> so our, our Farazon takes over. And as you say, he's he's quite a charismatic and well thought of yeah. person. He's, you know, fights in lots of battles and he's, you know, he's not a cowardly figure. He's no. somebody who's just prideful and um, too attached to life in the end. Um, but he, he's it's certainly... a nice wording. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he's certainly, he's popular and he's well liked by the people who, which yeah. is Numenor, the whole society has fallen at this point and the faithful are kind of a minority group yeah. um, essentially so um, so in the year 3261 Ar Farazon um, he, he learns from his captains that Sauron had um, kind of been looking for revenge against the Numenorians and considered them one of his chief enemies and yeah. critically um was declaring himself king of men in Middle yes. Earth, which, with our Farazon's ego, uh, didn't didn't go down too well because he considered himself king of men, yeah. um, and so he was he saw that as a rival to his position, and that angered him greatly. So he yep. he launched a, a fleet and landed at um, at Umbar, where we where we later see the corsairs of Umbar come from, who are yep. essentially the descendants of this group in a way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so he lands there and then marches north on Mordor. Yeah. But you also have to imagine, I think he also did that, not just because Sauron proclaimed this, he needed this victory to legitimize his claim. We mm. see, we know that very, very often in our own history, right? Um, that this is what kings who, well, had a very dodgy claim to the throne. Um, I mean, he, it, it wasn't that dodgy, you know, his father was the younger brother of the former king. Well, yes, you know, but mm. still, um, I think he also wanted to bring home this victory, um, to legitimize and to be like fully backed by everybody in Numenor. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, because he yeah. wasn't legitimate, really. Um, yeah, he just kind of took over. Yeah, there must have been some insecurity there that kind of played on him at the beginning. Yeah. Um, the invasion is successful and Sauron is taken prisoner in the year 3262. Um, so this is quite a well known story here. Um, yeah. Sauron <laughs> is taken prisoner. Um, and I'm going to read from the Akalabeth in a second. But um, Essentially, you wonder whether Sauron intended for this all to happen, you know, because yeah. he's playing a long game here and perhaps yeah. thought that he couldn't defeat the Numenorians through force of arms. Yeah. Um, and that's so his thing. He's not the warrior, right? He's the clever strategist, right? And mm. that is, that was, he was always two steps ahead. I also do think, yes, he couldn't. Be, he saw I can't defeat them or maybe with heavy casualties and losses why not you know destroy them from the inside let me go there I have my voice is very powerful mm. yeah it certainly works out for the best at least in the short term for Sauron yeah um, so I'm going to read from the Akalabeth because I think this is the best way of telling this part of the story and it's awesome so uh, <laughs> so here we go uh, such was the cunning of Sauron's mind and mouth and the strength of his hidden will, that ere three years had passed, he had become closest to the secret counsels of the king, for flattery sweet as honey was ever on his tongue, and knowledge he had of many things yet unrevealed to men. And seeing the favour that he had of their lord, all the counsellors began to fawn upon him, save one alone, Amandil, lord of Andunier, as Sildur's grandfather, once again, mm -hmm. Um, then slowly a change came over the land, and the hearts of the elf friends were sorely troubled, and many fell away out of fear, and although those that remained still called themselves the faithful, their enemies named them rebels. For now, having the ears of men, Sauron with many arguments gainsaid all that the Valar had taught, and he bade men think that in the world, in the east, and even in the west, there lay yet many seas and many lands for their winning, wherein was wealth uncounted. And still, if they should at the last come to the end of those lands and seas, beyond all lay the ancient darkness. And so this is dialogue here now. And out of it the world was made, for darkness alone is worshipful, and the Lord thereof may yet make other worlds to be gifts to those that serve him, so that the increase of their power 
shall find no end. So Sauron's words there. Yeah, I love that he calls Morgoth Lord. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was about to get worse. Um, I, it was something that stood out to me on this reading um, of this little passage here was the ancient darkness and the fact that that's capitalized in the text. Yeah. I find interesting. I mean, Tolkien's quite particular about where he uses capital yes. letters for things. Yeah. And he often uses them in places where it seems out of place because ancient yeah. darkness doesn't seem like a, a proper noun, you know, a name. It, But it's capitalized, I think, to um, emphasize its like importance as a kind of cosmological concept or, or mm -hmm. a sort of a philosophical one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he always capitalizes the West when he talks about the West in terms of Valinor. Yeah. Um, so it's the same kind of thing that Sauron's sort of doing here is kind of, he's it's emphasizing like he's the, the, the sort of theological importance of yes. the ancient darkness, which yeah. I'm not quite sure what he means by that. I don't know how you feel about that one. Um, does well, he mean me the, the void um, or is there no. something else that he's talking about? No, I thought that's one of the themes, right? Mm. So for me, that light and darkness, that, that was, mm. yeah. and for, for him, Morgoth stood for the darkness and darkness stands also for anything but enlightenment, like don't, don't start to read, don't question, don't start to question the world, you know, just follow darkness, mm. be in darkness. That's how I always, but I, it's not like I anal over analyze that passage. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to carry on reading because there's one more paragraph, um, which yes. is the best bit, I think. Of, it's probably my favorite section in the whole Ocalabeth, like, this bit. Um, what? I mean, the whole thing's really awesome. But <laughs> um, so, so Sauron's just told us about this ancient darkness. And then so the Pharazon's going to reply. And our Pharazon said, who is the lord of the darkness? Then behind locked doors, Sauron spoke to the king and he lied saying, it is he whose name is not now spoken for the Valar have deceived you concerning him, putting forward the name of Eru, a phantom devised in the folly of their hearts, seeking to enchain men in servitude for themselves. For they are the oracle of this Eru who speaks only what they will. But he that is their master shall yet prevail, and he will deliver you from this phantom. And his name is Melkor, lord of all, giver of freedom, and he shall make you stronger than they. So I, I love this, this passage. Uh, it makes me think about Chancellor Palpatine in Revenge of the Sith. <laughs> Do you know, I mean, you know exactly which, of course, which, yeah, of which course. scene I'm talking when about. When he talks to Anakin, yeah. Yeah. Have you heard the tragedy of Darth Melkor the Wise? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought not. It's not a story the Valar would tell you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the dark, basically. Yeah. No, mm. it, it is fascinating. He literally spins everything. Uh, yeah, well, he's he's the one who who's lying. But you know what I always felt? I always felt like Sauron really feels that way about him. He thinks Melkor in a way freed him because he can now be, you know, a, a lord of his. This is a bit like what Galadriel wanted. You know, she wanted lands to rule for her own. The the way Sauron and Melkor and all these evil dudes rule is ruthless there are no rules there's you know just so so this is a very different form of ruling than the valar and eru had in mind right mm. and it might seem to somebody who's interested in that yes it is freedom it is liberating because there are no rules right so i really do think that he in a way felt that way that malcor did free him from the chains and the rules of the valar he's not fully lying here no, I, yeah, I, I mean, he's lying about the um, yes, yes, I know, yeah, the, the the fact that Eru is you know yes a phantom and so yes. on, as he says here, but yes. but he yeah, there is a he's he's spinning a lie with truth in a way, isn't he? Because yeah. he yeah, I mean, 
I don't want to. I don't want to paint Melkor as an emancipator because he's clearly not. I mean, he literally enslaves people in the. Well, if you're an like evil person, he is. If you're an evil <laughs> yeah. person, he is. It depends on the on your point of view, right? Thank you, Obi Wan, for that. <laughs> Back on Star Wars. <laughs> Certain point of view, Luke. You're going to find that many of the truths we cling to depend greatly on our own point of view. But but look, the thing is, I think the the Numenorians experienced that themselves. They mm. came to Middle Earth, and literally, people worshipped them as gods. And they were like, mm. "Ooh, this is kind of cool. Well, what's happening here?" Um, because they were all of a sudden kings amongst men, um, mm. and I think in a way it appealed to them because you see later on these kings, you know, and these friends became rulers, right? And this is. He just spins further, spun, spun, spins, you know what I mean? Further, the concept of what the Numenorians already, they already had that within them and they kind of wanted to rule over Middle Earth and all that. And I think he saw that and he knew a lot. He either was, my theory is he was in Numenor before because Tolkien tells us many times mm. the shadow came to Numenor. I don't think it was just... Yeah. I Evil. think he was in Numenor like generations before this. I yes. don't think he was um, in Numenor like recent to this. No, 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 like, no. But I think before, he was, yeah, like yeah. hundreds of years beforehand. Yes. I think maybe he was. Yeah, yeah. He there's, mentions there's a, there's a passage which times. I won't I won't read, but it like yeah. coming up in the Ocalibeth, uh yeah. or actually just before this part, I think, yeah. um, where he, where Sauron first comes to Numenor, and it said it said there that he was surprised by you know how much their society had progressed and he was yeah. intimidated by it uh, yeah. yeah how does um, he know exactly i i'm I very read... loosely paraphrasing this but no but no it Im implies that he hadn't been there recently if he had been there at all but yeah. perhaps he had been there much earlier um, yeah definitely. he was a shapeshifter he knew mm -hmm. a lot about numenor and he knew how to you know to persuade them he knew the exact words they wanted to hear just as he did with Celebrimbor. Look, there's an epic speech he gives to Celebrimbor um, in the, is it in Unfinished? No, I think it's in the Cimmerillion um, version. And he he says, you know, mm, why don't Gilgalad and Elrond want you to be as successful as they are? Why don't the Valar, you know, it's really, really cool. He And he does exactly the same here. Right, um, that's in Of the Rings of Power and the Third Age, another one you mean, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. I read that recently with Chris. We we recorded uh, about um, yeah. Elrond, so we talked yeah. about that in that context. It's so cool what he tells them and how, mm. you know, but he knows exactly what each character wants to hear. Um, that's his power. And, um, yeah, so I, I do think, again, coming back to, to this passage, I I think he felt liberated and free. I think Ard Farazon certainly, yeah, he was tempted easily towards this yes. argument. And this is, yeah, you're exactly right. This is what he wanted to hear. And he yeah. he swallows it hook, line and sinker, doesn't he? Honestly. Yeah. Um, he although doesn't it does ask take, many questions. It does take a, a, a several years before he does launch his invasion of Valinor, which we'll come to. Yes. Um, so this is quite, a, it's about 50, 50 year years. period. Yeah. yeah, just under 50 yeah. years, I think, yeah. before he starts building the great armament. So. Yeah. Um, and during this time, get to get back to the faithful and Isildur and his uh, forebears here. Um, Amandil is, you know, he's the lord of the faithful. Um, he was extremely troubled by what's, what he was seeing here. Didn't tr he was the one person who just would never trust Sauron. Um, yeah. And so he gathers the faithful to him at, at Romenna uh, secretly, which is the um, main port in Numenor on mm -hmm. the east of the yeah. island. Yeah. Um, and no, he, west. No, Romeno's in the east. Oh, sorry, I thought it was in the west. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That surprised me actually um, when I read that recently because yeah. you associate them with the west. They like yeah. they come from Andunia, which is in the northwest. Yeah. And yes, you're and right. But El, because Elder he banned Londe. them, he banned them there. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, he banned, and then they had to kind of like secretly convene yeah. in, in in another city. So that's what happens. Yeah. Um, so Am Amandil has learned that Sauron is asking for Ar Farazon to cut down the white tree. Um, and do you remember back to Tar Palantir? We talked about this already. He made that prophecy and said yeah. that the line of the kings will fail if the tree yeah. is ever cut down. Yeah. Um, so 
with that in mind, Amand Dill is like extremely concerned about what's going on at this point. Yeah. And um, and it's important to know that Arfarazon hesitated for years because Sauron mm -hmm. asked him to do this for years. Mm -hmm. And he was, he obviously knew, you know, what his father-in-law, <laughs> <laughs> uncle, both, eek, um, what he, <laughs> what he prophesied. So he knew that. Um, and he hesitated for many years, but then finally, you know, Sauron got the better of him. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting what happens. I mean, yeah, you get the impression that it, Farazon was on the verge of relenting here already, but he yeah. was reluctant because of that prophecy and because yeah. it concerned him, you know, yeah, yeah. If he cuts this tree down, he's going to die. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what happens is um, when Amandil tells the group this, um, they all listen and, and they're all really concerned about it. But Isildur, and this is his first real contribution to the storyline, he he leaves without saying a word, um, yeah. disguises himself and secretly approaches the the area, the courtyard where the white tree was in Armelos. Yeah. And he in disguise like creeps up to the tree and this is like you know Sauron's guards are there and everything and he creeps mm -hmm. past them and then he cuts a fruit from the white tree from Nimloth um and so as this is why I say he's a very brave because like if he was caught he would have been killed yeah and that the Akalabeth implies that he was injured in, in that because the guards see him and, and try yeah. to stop him and he he's in disguise so he manages to get away without revealing himself yeah, and at that time, so it is also important to know Elendil, so Isildur's father, and Arfarazon had been friends once. They had been mm -hmm. childhood friends and very, very close actually once. And um, and I think even in the beginning, um, Elendil was the advisor of Arfarazon, um, but that changed over time. So they were literally, it wasn't like, oh, cool, the, um, you know, because in a way they were related and their family was important. Oh, he shows up, you know, in the courtyard. Let's know. He literally had to do that in secret because they did fall out like Elendil mm. and Arfarazon at one point. Yeah, Elendil was uh, one of the Council of the Scepter. I think he was the last yes. Lord of Andunia. Oh, was it so Elendil? So okay. So he, I yeah, I think Elendil. that's the way it works. But maybe, um, yeah, yeah, Elendil certainly was friends with Arfarazon. Yeah. You're right about that part. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's you get the impression that our Farazon was probably he was probably like that guy that's in your circle who has some like slightly dodgy political beliefs that isn't a bad person, but just like just think sometimes you think yikes. <laughs> like like in his younger days he was just like he was problematic, yeah. but he wasn't <laughs> problematic. <laughs> but uh, you know, occasionally he'd say things that are politically incorrect, kind of that yeah. kind of person. <laughs> but, yeah. but but there wasn't, you know, he wasn't necessarily like a bad person. He just maybe had a dodgy upbringing. Yeah. Um, and then once he becomes king, he becomes much, much, much worse. Uh, mm. That was, that's my impression. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I mean, he's sort of, he's one of the King's men. So uh, it's, it's, mm. it's hard to sort of place in your mind him being friends with Elendil, isn't it really? But he must have changed. Is my, my theory. Yeah, and also due to Sauron, you know, mm. he whispered for 50 years into Arfarazon's ear. Um, and, you know, just like Galadriel and Gagalad and other good people never trusted Sauron, I'm pretty sure Elendil didn't either. No, no, that's clear. I mean, Amandil was said to be the one person who just wouldn't listen. Yeah. And Elendil was, you know, yeah. of the same mind in that. Yeah. Um, so it, what happens then is that Sauron um, capitalizes on this because, you know, Isilda wasn't caught, but he was, there were witnesses to his stealing the, the yeah. seedling from the tree. So Sauron is then able to convince our Farazon to cut it down. Yeah. Um, and it's because of Isilda taking the, the tree. Yeah. Um, you get the impression it would have happened eventually it would have. or later yes. anyway. But yeah. um, but it's interesting that it's that moment that actually Sauron capitalizes on and uses to get his way. Yeah. Um, which is, again, Sauron, you know, using the truth to twist to his advantage. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So then the Great Armament is begun construction in 3310. Um, so that's... That's 48 years since Sauron came to the, yeah, 3262, Sauron was taken prisoner. Yes. Yeah. So it's 48 years later. Um, yeah. 
and that's that's the armada that our Farazon starts building to invade Valinor. Because yeah. by this point, he's completely gone, and Sauron has convinced him that the Valar are evil and that they are hoarding immortality. Yeah. Um, and so he's lost basically at this point. Yeah. He's a he's become an evil overlord king. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so he he builds this armada. The uh, the flagship is called Al Carondas, which was said to have a golden mast, and it was supposed yeah. to be like this enormous ship. Um, now I've, uh, it's a shame that there aren't more um, artist depictions of this. Because there aren't really very many good ones. No, um, hopefully not. we'll get some good ones in the, in yeah. the next few years. Pretty uh, sure, yeah. So, but what happened before to Amandil? Like, what's your hmm. theory? Where is that dude? Is he still sailing? Because you know, there's another. Who was? Who are the other two? I mean, it's not Erendil. Who are the? There's one couple that's never been seen again, sailing towards the Undying um, Lands. Um, well, two more and and. Uh, Idril? Idril. They, yes. um, they yeah. sail west and, and never heard yeah. them again. But you assume that they are received with open arms as elf friends. and well, Yeah, but we, okay, um, but, but what happened to Amandil? Amandil, so, yeah. So this is this is after the, the, the great armament was begun to be constructed. Yeah. Um, but before Arfarazon leaves, um, yes. Amandil decides to sail to Waman in order to basically yeah. repeat the mission that Erendil went on yeah, in order exactly. to seek out their Valar and uh, seek out yeah. the Valar and seek their forgiveness. Yeah. Um, and as you say, he's never heard from again. Um, yeah, it's a mystery. It's an intentional mystery, and yeah. I don't really have a, a good justification for my belief in this. But I, I tend to think that. The Valar said to him, "Look, uh, look, dude. <laughs> like, so he reached you, it. You so, so just... the shadow we see, he crossed because I mean, Arfarazon well, in a way. Re yeah, I mean, his his name means like friend of Amman. Like, yeah. so it's like thematically, it feels to me odd if the Valar would just like capsize his boat and drown him. Um, yeah. So th to me, like he sh he must have made it. If, if Farazon made it, then I don't. That's see why my thinking. Could have. Yeah." Th that is um, my my thinking. But yeah. I, I assume they said to him, "Look, you can't just um, Come make back, up the sins of your people. Like they're in open rebellion yeah. against us, and yeah. there's because th it's a different situation to to what happened yeah. with the Noldor and so on in the first age when <laughs> Erendil sails. You know, I I think probably the Valar would have said, um, you know, you're free to remain, but you can never leave. Yeah, uh, at that point." Well, we know they die in the Undying Lands because they're humans. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, let's move on. Um, so, then Amandil uh, sails with a few men. And then and then we get to the downfall of Numenor, which is three years later. So, yeah. Um, so, this is when our Farazon lands on the shores of, of Valinor. Um, yeah. He actually occupies the city of Tyrion briefly, which has been kind of deserted. And then... Yeah. The Valar have all kind of retreated, and then they they kind of rescind their authority to Eru and a, appeal directly to him to intervene, which yeah. is intriguing. I, I I'm not entirely sure why they do that um, that way because they surely could just kick them out themselves. Of course, um, yeah. But they don't do that, which I I, I find that interesting. But again, they never knew what to do with men. They didn't know the fate of men because mm. they never understood that theme Eru created. Um, and so they were unsure and asked their creator for, oh, what can we do with these people? They're not elves. <laughs> like, what is the plan with these people? Tell us. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, they could have maybe asked before they would set up the whole island of Numenor, Numenor. in the first Numenor. place, Numenor. you know. For some mm. advice on that one, but <laughs> there you go. You know. Um, so this is the downfall of Numenor. Um, so Al Farazon um, is killed, kind of. Well, he's kind of banished mm. this caves of the forgotten. Yeah, which is, he still lives. He's interesting. Yeah, he's uh, sort of yeah in a kind of limbo state. Um, it's like the dead man way. of Dunharrow in a way. I imagine them like an undead army buried under the mountain. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um and it's said that um they were they would one day fight in the Dagor Dagoreth in the last battle. Yeah. Um if you assume that that's canon, which is not necessarily 
um it's for people, me people debate that it is for me too yeah because i yeah. just like it as a myth so much but um and it's I, just very christian and biblical it's like doomsday right yeah it is yeah it's 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 another actual actual instance you know i started talking off about the moon stuff and the symb symbology there it's another area where i think the the norse and the pagan meets the christian in quite an interesting way and tolkien kind of preserves both in a sense um, because it's also very ragnarok yes uh, the last battle but our pharazon but many religions which, which side does this. he fight on does he fight does he fight for melkor yeah for the evil yeah um <laughs> It's never directly said, but I mean, you assume that he worshipped yeah. Melkor and yeah, he would have come sure. back as an evil. I don't think he redeems himself. I, no. I don't think that. Turin right. gets to redeem himself, you know, he gets the boss fight, mm. but um, I, I don't think Arpharazon is given. Interesting bit of trivia about Arpharazon, and we'll move on because he's, he's dead now, but um, one last thing on him. He... Um, would have been wielding Aranruth, which was um, Thingol's sword, which yeah. was passed down to, you know, to Erendil, to Elros, and mm -hmm. that was their heirloom of the royal house of Numenor. Mm -hmm. um, so he would have had that sword with him when he invades Valinor. And so if he comes back in the last battle, I like to think that he would have faced Thingol in battle in the Dagor Dagorath, and Thingol would have taken his sword back <laughs> at that point. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a it's one of the swords um, forged from the meteor by Aeol, right? Uh, I don't think so. I think. I think so. I think Aeol forged a few swords, and one of the swords Maybe. is the sword of Thingol. No, because Thingol has one of the swords, but he gives it away to, to Beleg, who gives it to... Who, uh, get, get, uh, gets killed yeah, by it with Turin and then it no 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 it's not Gurthang he forged a few swords out of that meteorite the other the, so the other one that was a twin he of had that one sword himself went to Maglin oh okay um but it, potentially it could have been because we don't know who did forge it but I don't think it's but, like okay. concrete okay sorry <laughs> so, I don't apologize it's fine um, you might be right because like there is space for that I just don't know if that's right um, People in the chat will let us know. Yeah. Um, then be like, why are you not prepared for this? <laughs> no, I mean, it's a, it's a minor piece of trivia. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah. So then... Um, and we'll have another cool sword. And we saw that appear in the in the teaser trailer, the much-loved teaser trailer. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> um, the most popular trailer on the internet. Well, in a way, yes. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so that sword, you know, is all already uh, existing in, in the days, uh, in the second age, in the days of Numenor. And uh, yeah, it will play a pivotal role later. I, what did you think of the, I mean, we don't need to dwell on this, but um, because that sword was forged in the first age by mm. Tekar, I think, right? Yeah, and like one of those myths of Nogrod, I want yes. to say. Might be Belagos, Belagos, but, forgot. But, but yeah, yes. Telkar is a dwarf. Um, yes. Doesn't, doesn't scream dwarvish a, style yeah. to me. So maybe um, they changed the hilt, or what is it called? The pom pom pom? The pommel is the part on the end of the hilt. Yeah, yeah. What? So they maybe um, they they changed just the look, but I saw it and I was like, "This is not a sword. A dwarf in the first age mm -hmm. would have, even if it would be forged for men." And I don't know why would a dwarf forge in the first age a sword for men? There weren't that. I mean, mm. yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm for somebody. Not, I'm not sure. Moment. Yeah, I mean, we. I don't think we know too much more than the fact that it was forged by, by Telkar. Yeah, um, but it came as a present to Numenor, and uh, yeah, the, the lords of Andunia then t took this sword, and it was an heirloom. Mm -hmm. It's cool. So then, the right. as we've already said, the faithful uh, managed to escape the destruction of the island and the downfall, and um, nine uh, ships. Yeah, on board nine ships, they take the seven seeing stones with them. They take the yeah. white tree, um, yeah. and they and Elendil himself takes various scrolls and books of lore and so on. Yes, um, and the stone of Eric, which again I wanted right. to ask. I wanted to ask you because it's a weird black stone. Hmm. So, question: <laughs> Is that a another meteorite is that something what Aeol found and then forged because we have this weird material like um 
Orthanc is actually made of a weird black stone. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you see that uh, appear a few times in Tolkien's Legendarium. And I, I was like, what is this stone? It's not a regular stone. It is no. said to be a black stone. It, I, I think it's a meteorite. I get that I think sense. So too. It's not stated, but it's no. a weird. It's a weird stone that doesn't. It doesn't belong in no. the place where it's found. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, and that's the stone that we see later on. You already mentioned Don Harrow. That's the yeah. stone that we um, is in the story to the Lord yeah. of the Rings later. And they took um, the the ring of the bling of butter here. <laughs> yeah yeah they obviously take that with them because that that yeah. ring is probably still around in the present day somewhere um it's yeah. you know it's just just go to a jeweler and ask and <laughs> he'll forge it for you um and then so arnor and gondor were founded in the year 3320 of the second age yeah um, which i have a question for you so go ahead you know I'm never a big fan of splitting up your powers, right? And I do think, because it is said, that there was trouble at sea, and this is why they split up. So the plan was never, oh, let's split up. I take the north of Middle-earth, and you take um, over the, the south, basically, or southeast. Um, because they had many colonies in the second age already in middle earth there were numenorians living there um and it, i find it so interesting that due to a storm it's not a storm i think it was just whatever um but the ships split up so four ships mm -hmm. went to arnor um and that is where elendil founded arnor basically it didn't go to arnor but this is why elendil founded arnor and then the other um uh, five ships, so three, uh, three and two. Um, I think, um, Anarion just had the two and, um, Isildur had three ships because he was the older, most likely, I would assume. Mm. Um, so father had four, then three, then two. I think that is what this should tell us. And yeah, and so they split up for the first time. And then later on, Arnor splits up again, mm -hmm. right? In three separate kingdoms. And I do think, well, that was a big mistake. Yes, strategically, you know, it was good to cover the north and the south. Yes. Um, but it also weakens, um, you to split up. And those again were just nine ships. It wasn't like millions of people lived in the north and millions of people mm. then in the south. It was just nine ships, right? So I would have stayed together if I were them, but you know, I didn't. Yeah. Know. I it's a common theme for things to split apart. You, yeah. you already mentioned Arnor splitting apart later on in yeah. the Third Age. Um, yeah. You're right. It's it's the division of things and the diminishment of things happening yeah. over time is like very noticeable in the histories, and it's it, yeah. it's paralleled by the kind of splitting up of the light as well. You know, the two, there's the two trees, and then there's the Silmarils, and the, there's mm -hmm. the sun and the moon but they're not as awesome as the trees are and and mm. and and then later on there's the um the fire of galadriel is kind of like a a pale imitation of the yeah of the silmarils and it's it's lesser and it's diminished um yeah. and then you have the same thing with the trees as well right i mean the trees there's the two trees which you know is the same source of the light that i just mentioned but but then there's that tree that is inspired the the white tree of Nimloth and and then that, that line gets passed down and then the, eventually we get to the white tree of Gondor and then yeah. that's almost dying at the end of the third age and then it's renewed but yeah but so it's, it's mirrored there too um so the point being like this is um a world that's in decline constantly yeah and then there, there are cycles that refresh those things yeah but but it's it's the medievalist perspective that Tolkien has of things being yeah. way more awesome in the distant past, and, yeah. and things splitting apart. Um, yeah, but and, it's also a power and, symbol. I think it it also speaks for all of these kings and a few of these kings. You know, they wanted power for their own. If if they would all have gone to Arnor, just let's hmm. say, it would be Elendil who would be the king, um, and then the oldest brother would be would rule as the king. But this way, all of them were kings. Yeah, because what what happens? The weaker to kings, you know. To explain that, Isildur and Adarion share the rulership of Gondor. Yeah. Um, 
which they they have like seats side by side in um Osgiliath. So they, yeah. they rule together from there, but then they have their two separate towers either side of Osgiliath, yeah. which are Minas Arnor and Minas Ithil, as we've yeah. said. Um, so yeah, the sharing of power doesn't necessarily always work out well, that's true. No, and you see that in our own history, you know, when when uh, the, the, uh, the children of Charlemagne split up, right? Mm. And it wasn't the oldest taking over, but like there were lots of kingdoms all of a sudden. And that always is problematic. Um, and a power play um, starts. And it is so fascinating that, I mean, um, Isildur became then the king of both, basically the last high king. Um, and then the next is literally Aragorn because all the ones in between, the kingdom was split, mm -hmm. um, which is really sad. But yes, very symbolic for Aragorn's rule, right? Mm. The last king of Arnor also tries to reunite them, doesn't he? Because he tries yes. to claim the king of the king, yes. the throne of Gondor. But it's um, but too they, far gone. Yeah, but it's too far gone at that point. Yeah, it's a pretty weak claim, really. Yes. Um, yeah. But you're right, you know, because they would have been better off if they had have consolidated their power in one place. Potentially. Yeah. Like, yeah. look at Minas Ithil. A few years later, several yeah. years later, Minas Ithil gets taken by Sauron. Yeah. And and if they had have consolidated their power in one place if if elendil was right there maybe they could have yeah. rolled in and retaken it yeah. straight away potentially yeah, yeah no yeah. who knows um we never i know but i it, agree one thing to note here is that the scepter of anumenas which was the badge of the king of arnor which elendil had was originally mm -hmm. the scepter of the lords of andunia yeah. so that also survived um yeah and that's the same scepter that Aragorn gets in the Lord of the Rings at the end. Yeah. Um, Elrond gives him all the other heirlooms of his house, but he won't give him that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, because that's the thing that he has to earn. Um, that and, I know. Yeah. And, his and Elrond's daughter, of course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, one last thing, maybe. Um, so, two years before the Battle of the Last Alliance, um, yeah, Isildur has to flee um, because mm. um, Sauron sacks um, Minas Ithil. And he doesn't just do that strategically because that was basically at the entrance. If you look at the map, maybe you can, you know, insert a map. You're very good with these <laughs> inserting thingies. Um, so that is a very... Said. Yeah, that is a very strategic point, uh, you know, to for the entrance to Mordor. Um, and this is also why later on the Witch King takes uh, over that place. It is interesting, and he mainly does that because one of the main seeing stones, the Ethel Stone, is there, and Sauron wanted to get his hands on. Uh, I have a cool video about all the seven Palantiri in Middle Earth and where they were placed and why. Mm. And, well, he made a lot of attacks on exactly the places where the stone um, him and the Witch King. Mm. Um, so he wanted to cut their communication. Yes, he obviously also wanted to use the stones, but he also wanted to cut them off from each other because that was how they were communicating. They didn't have eagles that, you know, or like telephones mm. or mobile phones. <laughs> um, they, it was a very long way. Like Anor is literally in the north, just below um, mm. the, the um, um, Witch King's... Uh, um, Angmar. Angmar, yeah. Um, it's quite far up north and um, Gondor is very far south, so it would take days, weeks, whatever, to travel to get messages through. So the, the Palantiri were very useful for that and yeah, mm. he, he wanted to cut them off. Well, that was probably why they felt confident to divide their kingdoms in a way, because they had that. Yeah, but it's not about communication, it's about strength. So how mm. many people are on one ship? 400 ish 300 Maybe. we don't 200? know i assume yeah. they were fairly big ships but yeah still um and i don't think it was like the titanic it was smaller ships this mm. is still like yeah and so that those are not many people and those were women and children as well it's not like warriors so how many how many warriors were there in the beginning days with five ships in Gondor, not many, and Gondor was literally at the borders of Mordor. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a little bit kind of foolhardy to build a, <laughs> a city so close to Mordor. Really. 
But it also shows you the, the bravery of Isildur, which is really cool. And this is exactly what, if you remember Medros, where did he place his fortress? He placed strategically, but also Fingolfin in a way, but they placed their fortresses close to Angband. So to be right. literally the neighbor of Morgoth to keep an eye on him and to keep him at bay. Yes, that is very dangerous, but also very, you know, brave. Um, and, that is exactly what Isildur did, which is cool. Also, Finrod as well with his um, the original Minas Tirith. <laughs> yes, uh, Tol Sirion. Yeah, um, that's extremely close, and that's one yeah. of the first places to fall. Um, yeah, Sauron takes that over. Yeah, as well. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, Isildur escapes, and he um, he takes with him for the second time. He rescues the white tree. He he rescues a sapling of it, yeah. which is there in Minas Tirith at that point. Yeah. Um, and then I assume he probably, um, I was talking about this with Chris recently because Chris uh, brought this up as well when we were talking about Elrond, but uh, we, we speculated maybe he brought that all the way up north with him to Rivendell but, and like planted it in Elrond's garden. But actually, having had some time to think about this, I think maybe he probably just planted it in Minas Tirith at that point and that's when it stayed there. Um, but I think presumably I read, he, he would have rescued it? one of the Palantirs at this point as well. Yes. Because Sauron doesn't get the Palantir. No, just, just he rescued the Ithi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so then he sails down the Anduin and then he sails up the coast to Lindon, where Gilgalad is. Yeah. And um, and then that's when the last alliance is formed. And Elendil and Gilgalad yeah. make this pact to band yeah. together and march on Mordor. Yeah. Um, so his dad helps him. Yeah, yeah. That's what you do, isn't it? You ask your parents for help when you need, when you yeah, when your castle gets invaded by an evil dark lord. Um, <laughs> yep. So that was the year thirty four thirty, um, and then they march to Imladris, Rivendell, and they they garrison there for a couple of years and, and gather their armies yeah. and yeah, gather all their forces, um, and so Rivendell becomes like a military base for a little while. Um, yeah, and. And then eventually they pass over the mountains. They pass over the high pass, actually, which is the, the same pass that Bilbo and the dwarves yeah. pass through in The Hobbit, um, which is, remember that, because that's going to come back at the end. And then so they march on on Mordor, and then the Battle of Dagorlad was fought in the year 34-34. Um, a lot of people dies. Uh, which Rip die. Thranduil's dad. Yeah, Orifer dies, um, Amdir dies as well, who was yeah. the original king of Lorien. Um, yeah. And Galadriel and then, was like, oh, cool, opportunity here. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> opportunity is knocking for her. Um, <laughs> I don't think she thought that. But, um, <laughs> no, you know what I mean. <laughs> um, I, I always wonder, how do they get through the gates, you know, the gate, the Black Gate of Mordor? Because that had to have been an obstacle that they would have had to contend with. Because um, the, the you know the Battle of Dagorlad is outside of Mordor. It's that was outside, where the yes. where the Black Marshes are. Yes, basically, exactly. that's why that yeah. the dead whole place marshes. is haunted. Um, yeah. And you know, Gollum tells us this in the Lord of the Rings. So, but then they still have to get into Mordor with their army. So how, how do they do that? Like, <laughs> but there are more. There is um, there are more entry ways. There's not just the mm. Black Gate. There are two or three fortresses and you can get through them mm. um good i made a video about mordor yeah, yeah, yeah it's not just the black gate there are other entryways okay. um is it is that the ash mountains on that side or the shadow mountains don't remember one of them um and you you can also go through Obviously, it's harder. It's easier. So, to these, are these fortresses that the Gondori has built in the yes. Second Age? Then, yes. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. I'll have to watch your video. And I, <laughs> yeah, everybody, please. Uh, <laughs> I also don't don't really remember the name, but they then later become Orc Orc strongholds. Mm. Um, yeah, Kirithungul is one of them. Kirithungul is one. Yeah. 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 Um, but you can't get a whole army up the stairs of Kiro Fungal, can you? No, but there are other... <laughs> and Shelop's already there at that point, presumably, so you would oh, want no. to. <laughs> oh, no, but, you know, maybe she wasn't hungry that day. They went through, yeah, but there there are ways to, to go. Obviously, you don't go through the east, uh, 
via rune and it's mm. yeah mother is really well protected as uh, we mm. just pointed out but yeah one does not simply walk into mordor I never ask myself the question but good question yeah, they did get through. Um, yeah. And then the Siege of Baradur begins, which is a quite a long siege. It takes years. Um, and at that point, Anarion um, is sadly unceremoniously killed by a, a missile that's launched from one of the yeah. windows of Baradur. Yeah, um, very weird death, but okay. Yeah, it's uh, it seems a bit of a kind of anticlimactic death it it? is yes because Um, his brother gets the super cool death in a way and he's like oh okay okay don't look up yeah um so so, it's a long bloody siege and baradur is you know maintained by the power of the ring so they can't get in um so yeah it takes seven years the siege of baradur um it's quite a long long time for a siege and you have to wonder like how they maintained their kind of supply lines as well into Mordor. They, mm. I suppose they must have occupied like the south of Mordor where there's, there was said to have been farmlands and stuff down there. So maybe that made yeah. things easier. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. And then it's... I guess what, who knows what the orcs were eating during this time in Baradur. I mean, maybe. Wait, or maybe they split. So there's the Sea of Nurn and mm. Nurn was actually really fruitful. This is how, um, how Sauron fed his armies. There were, there was farmland and everything, um, mm. which you can't imagine seeing, seeing the images of, uh, or the portrayal of Mordor. But yeah, in the, so south of Baradur, basically, mm. uh, near the, the Nurn Sea, um, it was a fruitful land. Yeah. Maybe from there or they, you know, one they opened one of the entryways that was where their supplies came from right i mean at that time uh oskiliath still stood and oskiliath is literally just a thrown stow away from from the en- entry to mordor yeah true i mean you still have to march all the way north and then all the way south again but yeah, yeah it, it would be possible i suppose yeah um yeah if they've wiped out all the orcs. There's a really no cool, there's a, there's even a road and it's, co- I think it's called Sauron's Road going yeah. through. <laughs> Sauron's yeah, that's, road. that's the road that Frodo and Sam travel on, yes. like briefly, yeah. and then realize yeah. that it's a bad idea and leave the road. Yeah. But um, yeah. I think in the narrative, it says that that's Sauron's main road, um, yeah. even though Frodo and Sam didn't realize. Yeah. Um, so then eventually Sauron bursts out of Baradur and uh, he's had enough and he um, kind of, you know, forces his way through the, the siege. And then on the slopes of, of uh, Mount Doom, he fights Elendil and Gilgalad in uh, yeah. personal combat. And so yeah. it's just the two of them challenge him. And Elrond, I think, in the Council of Elrond tells us that he was there with Círdan and Isildur was there as well. Yeah. Um, although they don't all jump in the fight it's just seemingly no. it's just elendil and gilgard yeah um, i mean it's it is very reminiscent to you know because you just mentioned he came he finally came mm-hmm. and i think everybody by now knows uh, knows ooh, now knows uh, that you and i love that passage you know from um morgoth versus fingolfin and mm-hmm. this is very reminiscent and i really do think so it's not like it, it was a bit different because Fingolfin literally called him out and was like, oh, you, are you too scared to fight a mere elf? Um, but it, it was in a way similar because Sauron doesn't like to fight. He doesn't like single combat. That's not his mm-hmm. way of ruling and fighting and winning a war. Um, but yeah, I think he saw, okay, this is like literally never ending. And this is why he came out. Not because he wanted he, he he loves fight. No, he didn't have another choice, did he? I mean, he was yeah. literally boxed into his own tower yeah. and can get out. Um, yeah. So Gilgalad and Elendil mortally wound Sauron, um, but yeah. are mortally wounded themselves in the process and they die. Um, yeah. By the heat, so then, which is like ooh. Yeah, I was going to get to that in a minute because I've got another oh, reading sorry. for that. Um, yeah. But. Yeah, so what kind of happens is, or at least it's implied, is that Silda sort of takes the hilt of the sword and the, the broken blade and cuts the ring off of Sauron's dead body. So he mm-hmm. kind of loots the corpse rather than, you know, the dramatic slash, last minute slash that we see in the movie. It's mm-hmm. it's, it's 
yeah, don't think of it in terms of the movie visuals. Think of it in no. terms of the, the text. It, it, we don't get a description of that moment, but it's it's strongly implied that you know yeah. Sauron's already kind of dead, or at least his body yeah. is. Yeah, um, his spirit endures as it does for of many more he can't die. years. Yeah. But, yeah. So yeah, I was going to read the um, the scroll of Isildur that Gandalf finds in in Minas Tirith later mm -hmm. in Third mm -hmm. Age, um, which is Isildur's account of recovering the ring. Yeah. Um, so it's it's interesting, I think, in light of other stuff that we're going to cover later on in this conversation potentially, um, because it there's hints of like ring temptation here. There's like mm -hmm. you can tell that he's been corrupted by yeah. the ring here. Yeah. Um, so here we go. The great ring shall go now to be an heirloom of the North Kingdom, but records of it shall be left in Gondor, where also dwell the heirs of Elendil, lest a time come when the memory of these great matters shall grow dim. You know, like at the end of the Third Age. <laughs> it was hot when I first took it, hot as a gleed, and my hand was scorched, so that I doubt if ever again I shall be free of the pain of it. Yet even as I write, it is cooled, and it seemeth to shrink, though it loseth neither its beauty nor its shape. Already the writing upon it, which at first was as clear as red flame, fadeth, and is now only barely to be read. It is fashioned in an elven script of Eregion, for they have no letters in Moror for such subtle work. But the language is unknown to me. I deem it to be a tongue of the black land, since it is foul and uncouth. What evil it saith, I do not know, but I trace here a copy of it, lest it fade beyond recall. The ring misseth, maybe, the heat of Sauron's hand, which was black and yet burned like fire, and so Gilgalad was destroyed, and maybe were the gold made hot again, the writing could be refreshed. But for my part I will risk no hurt to this thing, of all the works of Sauron, the only fair. It is precious to me, though I buy it with great pain. So the movie has like a slightly truncated version of this yeah. scroll. Um, it has the same line about it is precious to me, which, you know, we, we've heard that before. Um, <laughs> Here, you've earned it. No process. <laughs> he will risk no hurt to this thing and it's yeah. of all the works of sauron the only fair which yeah. really is probably the worst thing sauron ever yeah. did <laughs> yeah. and it's yeah it's intriguing little passage go on it is and i have a question mm -hmm. so because he is the one that writes down the encrypt inscription is it Inscription, yeah. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> uh, blonde moment, uh, for in a moment, and um, he writes it down, right? And mm. um, it says he traces it, which I, I just I can imagine him with like you know, with like a tracing paper and rubbing yeah. like a crayon over it, yeah, <laughs> because he can't read it, so it's not like he knows what he's he's doing there. I, I don't and, think he literally traces it like that, no, but. no, no. <laughs> and um, but we know, so how did the elves learn and why did they take off their rings? Because they learn and they hear, in a way, telepathically. And again, I know this because I did a video on it and I mm. did some research. They learned telepathically in a way that Sauron was forging the one ring and in a way they yeah. had him say the ring. Gandalf that, says it right after reading this in the Council of Elbond. He says yes, you, that or, um, yeah. Keller Brimbor heard those words over a great distance yeah, when yeah. the ring was forged. So Keller Brimbor talked to Galadriel, to Elrond. They were all bearers later on. So mm -hmm. Elrond must know what is written on the ring, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that law so poem, he, the poem, you know, the one ring to rule them all poem. Yeah. That, that's like a, that's a law poem that everybody, all the law masters would know. So Elrond would definitely know. He would, right? But in a way, how it is described then later on in the Third Age is like, 
Okay, um, nobody, like, because Gandalf has to go to Gondor to find out mm. about the writings, and this is what Isildur wrote. He he has to find that, and I find that so weird. Why didn't Gandalf just go to Elrond? And Elrond and Gandalf, they were both on the White Council. Mm. They have spoken to each other. Why did he not ask Elrond for advice or Galadriel? This is so weird, mm. because they must have known about about what about the writing yeah that and the, appears on the ring and yeah um, because he would goes it have told the elves about this do you think or i mean this no, but, scroll is specifically put in gondor i in know case but memory no, no. shall grow dim of it no um, no but they heard what was what what he said the words he said and that hmm. is what is engraved in the ring right and so the elves, Ekelebrimbo, heard it. Yeah, so, so they, Elrond would know the words, but he wouldn't necessarily know that if you heat the ring up, that an uh, inscription will magically appear. He wouldn't necessarily know that part. Yeah, true. Um, yeah. Because Isilda knows that and records it and writes it down here. And yeah. then a couple of years later, he's based, dead. Yeah. So yeah. he. Yeah, but it is in Gonda. It's found in Gonda in the library. Yeah. Yeah, and so Saruman finds it there first, and then Gandalf kind of um, he realizes that Saruman knows things that he couldn't yeah. possibly know unless he had a source of information. Yeah. So that's why he investigates in Minas Tirith at that point. Yeah, yeah. So it, it works for me. Personally. Yeah, it's just you know like the words and and all that. Yeah. So the elves knew about that. So I always wondered, okay, could have given Gandalf some more information about this, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Um, yeah, to find out. It's not. It's also not Gandalf's job, is it? It's supposed to be Sar Saruman's job. Um, yeah. And you know, Elrond also says in the Council of Elrond, he says um, that it's perilous to study too deeply the arts of the enemy. Yeah. And so he would, as a point of wisdom, would probably deliberately not study this in too much depth. Yeah. Really, necessarily. Um, yeah. So yeah, so that's what happens, um, and then. In the in the next couple of years, the next year or so, um, Isilda plants the the white tree um, in Minas Tirith, um, and then yeah, so in Minas Arnor at that point, and then so he spends a year or two there, kind of tutoring Anarion's son, who is now the king of Gondor, because yeah. Isilda yeah, himself yeah. is the king of Arnor, yeah, because he's Elendil's heir, so he. Yeah. He's sort of inherits that kingdom, and then Anarion's son takes over Gondor. Mm -hmm. um, interesting that he's thoughtful and insightful enough, and has the foresight to kind of spend a couple of years just sort of tutoring him and teaching him how to rule. Yep, um, because he had four sons himself, right? Um, mm. I think at that time just th three. Oh, I don't. Um, yeah, three. The um, Valandil was born, I think, just before or after his death, actually. So, yeah. So he had three. Yeah, Valandil was, yeah, he was, so he, he, he was, was born in Rivendell. In Rivendell and, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And um, so he didn't obviously come with them on the, yeah, in the, the last alliance. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so it's cool that he teaches his brothers. But this is very, you know, like in a way cool. And, you know, like the twins, Elrond and Elros, they were taught, you know, by, um, well, in a way, mortal enemies, but also the, the sons of Fing, uh, um, um, Fëanor, who are also relatives of them and not that far related, pretty close related. Um, so yeah, that was also cool. And there's always this father figure of not the real father, right? Like the, um, you have uh, with Kirdan and Gilgalad and then later Gilgalad and Elrond. So the, you very often mm. have this, tutelage of yeah foster fathers are foster you know, father. all over yeah. the place in the legendary yeah. and there's loads of them yeah um so so that there's, there's about two year period there um and then we get to the disaster of the gladden fields and silda's death um yeah which happens the on the 4th of october which is my birthday <laughs> <laughs> is that right i didn't realize it was on the 4th of october um yeah interesting <laughs> They were attacked, and I think on the fifth he actually dies, but on the fourth is the attack. You know, my birthday is the day before the One Ring is destroyed. It's the 24th of March. Mm. One Ring is destroyed on the 25th. 
so uh so i'm going to read out now the um the few sections from the disaster of the gladden fields which is yeah. in unfinished tales yeah. which was written after the lord of the rings um i find this text really really interesting and fascinating and of the stuff in unfinished tales that's written after the lord of the rings about the lord of the rings i think it's the, one of the strongest ones yeah. um like the, the saruman stuff that we get in unfinished tales i think kind of actually muddies the waters more yeah. it makes the story more difficult to pass but but this I really like because it it part it gives us a different um, glimpse of Isildur's character and paints him in a different light. Mm -hmm. um, so Isildur uh, travels; he's traveling back to Arnor via the same route that he came down. So he's he's headed up towards the the high pass again, um, which in the text is known as the Kirith Thorn in Andrast. Um, in Elvish, but that's that's as I said earlier, that's the same high pass that Bilbo and the dwarves get lost in. Um, it's supposed to be clear of orcs, but it, anyway, um, not to be confused with the Red Horn Pass from the Lord of the Rings. That's a different one where they try to pass over Caradhras. Um, he's traveling with two hundreds of his knights and um, three of his sons. So Elendur is the oldest, and yeah. Aratan and Kirion are the other yeah. two. And this is on the 13th day of the march, Isildur's company was ambushed by orcs. Suddenly, as the sun plunged into cloud, they heard the hideous cries of orcs and saw them issuing from the forest and moving down the slopes, yelling their war cries. In the dimmed light, their number could only be guessed, but the Dúnedain were plainly many times, even to ten times, outnumbered. Isildur commanded a thangale to be drawn up, a shield wall of two serried ranks that could be bent back at either end if outflanked, until at need it became a closed ring. If the land had been flat or the slope in his favour, he would have formed his company into a deer knife and charged the orcs, hoping by the great strength of the Dunedain and their weapons to cleave a way through them and scatter them in dismay. But that could not now be done. A shadow of foreboding fell upon his heart. So um, I'm just going to stop here just for a second because there's a couple of bits of Elvish that I should explain here. Um, a thang nail is a shield wall. So uh, it says that in the text, actually. It says a shield wall of two serried ranks that could be bent back at either end if outflanked. Um, what I like about this is it's like military tactics, which we don't often get like yeah. that much of that in Tolkien. Not but um, cool. when you do get it, it's kind of cool. Um, you get it so, in Gondolin and partly in a mm -hmm. Numenor additional material for Numenor with a mm -hmm. with a steel arrows and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, more it's more a thing that you get in some of the earlier works. Yeah, um, Gondolin, you partly get it because you know they mm -hmm. then retract from there, then they go to the square of the king, then this is the last battalion there, and then the enemy attacks from the tower. Like it's yeah. yeah. Yeah, you get kind of more blow by blow, you know, yeah. accounts of where enemy forces are moving and so yeah. on. In but a lot of first way. age battles as well. Like he explains mm -hmm. where did they come from, where were they ambushed, what was the open floor. Yeah, the Neo Knight of Onoidiad has stuff like that as well, yeah. to, to an yeah. extent. Um, yeah. That's obviously quite a large scale battle, but. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and then the other word there was the deer knife, which is like a wedge shaped formation that they could make if they needed to. So these are well around uh, soldiers who, who know these different formations. Okay. You know, you kind of, you think about like the Romans with their, you know, kind of rectangular shields or that kind of thing. They could form yeah. a, a formation with their shields and their spears. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, uh, we'll move on. Yeah, because boring. <laughs> The vengeance of Sauron lives on, though he may be dead, he said to Elendur, who stood beside him. There is cunning and design here. We have no hope of help. Moria and Lorien are now far behind, and Thranduil four days' march ahead. And we bear burdens of worth beyond all reckoning, said Elendur, for he was in his father's confidence. The orcs are now drawing near. Isildur turned to his esquire. Otar, he said, I give this now into your keeping. 
and he delivered to him the great sheath and the shards of Narsil, Elendil's sword. Save it from capture by all means that you can find, and at all costs, even at the cost of being held a coward who deserted me. Take your companion with you and flee. Go, I command you. Then Otar knelt and kissed his hand, and the two young men fled down into the dark valley. Um, so I think this is really important. Um, yeah. There's a couple of things here. The So first of all, his his eldest son, Elendur, is in his father's confidence, we're yeah. told here. Yeah. And it's this is remarked on when he says, we bear burdens of worth beyond all reckoning. Yeah. Um, which I think maybe there's a little bit of ring temptation going on with the son there because he's talking about the ring, uh, basically. I mean, he's also talking about the sword. Um, yeah. That's the thing. Uh, we bear tokens of worth beyond all reckoning. And it's, yeah, but it's mainly, cool I think... because this Tolkien setting up a parallel between Narsil as an heirloom and the yeah. ring, which yeah. is, you know, Isildur talks about making it an heirloom of the Northern yeah, yeah, Kingdom yeah. and all the rest of it. But I think it's rather the ring because they were on their way to Elrond to give him the ring. That was mm -hmm. the whole purpose of the journey. He wanted to or wanted to try, uh, you know, to let mm -hmm. the ring go because what would have happened? He wouldn't have given it to him. Never. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you about that when we get to it. But Yeah, no, he would never have given up the <laughs> ring. Um, it was still too strong. Yeah, it's... So it, Narsil doesn't have a hold on him. It's, it's extremely no. important to him, but yeah. it, but it doesn't have like a, a psychological hold on him. Like yes, the it's does. not a weapon anymore. It's a symbol. But mm. they were talking about a weapon, and isn't that? I don't know if it's in that text, but I think Elendor also suggests use the bloody ring. Yeah, we'll get to that in a second. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's great that you remember this as well as you do. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> So yeah, I, and and then in the second part he says, save it from capture by all means that you can find and at all costs. Yeah. So it's it's kind of it's placing a huge importance on Narsil there. Yeah. Um and yet he'll trust somebody else who's just his squire to go and cross the mountains with it. Yeah, but just with Narsil, he could have given the yeah. bloody ring to him and say, Run, because the orcs didn't know fully what they were not they, consciously. This text no. also also implies that the ring was they drawing felt, them near to it. Yes. So yeah, exactly. But, but I don't imagine they would be conscious. No, they and they weren't looking. Aware of it. They weren't looking for the ring. So he no. could have given the ring. That one dude would have escaped, and they would, you know, try to hold off the orcs and trick the orcs. Didn't. Or he could have escaped himself. Like he didn't need to give the ring to somebody. He could have just left as yeah. soon as possible, and maybe, yeah. maybe the outcome would have been the same anyway. But yeah. But he, he's going to go down fighting with his ring before he'll yeah. do anything else. And so the, the Numenorean shield wall uh, prevails against the first attack of the orcs and their armor holds up against the, the arrows. Um, and so they manage to fight them off, but they're still outnumbered and surrounded. There was a pause, though the most keen-eyed among the Dunedain said that the orcs were moving inwards, stealthily, step by step. Elendur went to his father, who was standing dark and alone, as if lost in thought. Atarinya, he said, what of the power that would cow these foul creatures and command them to obey you? Is it then of no avail? Alas, it is not, Senya. I cannot use it. I dread the pain of touching it, and I have not yet found the strength to bend it to my will. It needs one greater than I know than I now know myself to be. My pride has fallen. It should go to the keepers of the three. So this is what you were talking about. He's um, yeah. he's talking about the keepers of the three elven rings, and he's yeah. on his way to Rivendell. So yeah. presumably he's thinking about talking to Elrond yeah. about this. Yeah. But is he? <laughs> because you know he's saying this knowing that he's probably facing impending death yeah. um and the elendor moment where elendor suggests mm. oh use the bloody ring is very reminiscent to boromir, boromir. yes yeah it does make you think of him doesn't it yeah that's true yeah. um actually i think isilda's whole storyline makes me think of boromir in several places but yeah because um, of the heirloom to our people use it for yeah. for our, but he never wanted to you i don't think he sees 
the heirloom factor as using it like Sauron did. It is more mm. like we killed the Dark Lord and this is, you know, what is left of him. And this is my claim to fame. This is, I'll put mm. this in, you know. Uh, he rationalizes it to himself that he, you know, uh, he, he's lost his, he says it to Elrond and Elrond. To his it, he lost his Elrond father and. Yeah. About how he, yeah, he yeah. lost his father and his brother and yeah. now he's entitled to claim, yeah. excuse me, claim a wear guild which is a interesting like medieval legal term, which was yeah. a real thing, which was like, if you've been harmed or your family's yeah. been harmed, you're entitled yeah. to compensation basically. Yeah. Which is, I think is an awesome word, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so he, the Atarinya is Elvish for father. Um, and so he says, what of the power that could cow these foul creatures and command them to obey you? Um, so, has Isildur been trying already to command walks? Like he, he must have been. He must have been using the ring. He must have tried it on. Yeah, um, I think he said like the pain of touching it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Here as well, which yeah. you know recalls the pain that he felt when he first touched it when it was yeah. hot, but it's not still hot. So why does it hurt him to touch it? I, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I think. Well, I, I think first of all. The ring was way more powerful um, at the beginning of the Third Age, just after, you know, the the fall the fall of Sauron. It mm. was way more powerful. It was way more sentient. It was in a way, like Isildur described it, you know, still glowing, although it was shrinking. And, you know, it then shrunk mm. over time because it is in a way like, look, things are important when you believe in them, right? Um, this is what the, the Greek gods always said, you know, when people are still talking about us, we are important and this fuels our power when people mm. believe in us, pray to us, I tell love our stories. Yeah. yeah. And this is in a way, but then Sauron got forgotten, right? Nobody cared for Sauron anymore. He was just some urban myth. And this is why the ring also shrinked and you know, what was less powerful um, because the fear of Sauron and that symbol also at that time, third age, I don't know, 500, 600, whenever, was at its weakest, you know, when, when, uh, mm. after this, after this river. point, when it goes into the river, really, I mean, it's dormant yeah. from that point onwards and then yeah. goes into the mountains and it's yeah. forgotten about, really. Yeah. As, uh, this whole passage does change our perception of who Isilda was, though. And, you know, I started yeah. out talking about this a little bit. And yeah, it, because it does paint him in a different light, because he's clearly he's realizing at this point that the ring is too much for him to, yeah. to you know, it's too it's above his station. Basically, it's like he's not powerful enough to bend it yeah. to his will. Um, I don't think that giving it to Elbron is a great idea either. <laughs> uh, personally, I don't. I don't see that Elrond is the right person to have it, but he might be the right person to decide what to do. Yes, um, I don't think he would have taken it or claimed it. Mm. At that time, who knows what Galadriel would have done. She was a different mm. person at that time. She, you know, I don't know, because I do think they would have held a council there because he said the three bearers. So I do mm. assume all three of them were there at that time. Um, yeah, yeah. Gandalf wasn't there, so Kirdan, where was he? Because did he return straight to the Havens after? He was the at the Falas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sure. do we? I assume um, he would have just sailed back. Probably, yeah, but. yeah, I assume. But maybe you know they always held council. He he came he came there and uh, expected the three of them to mm. be there to discuss what he couldn't have done, you know, before in in the slopes at the slopes of Mount Doom. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't think Elrond would have taken it. It's like you said, I think he would have discussed and threw mm -hmm. in some options. Yeah, they, they would have come to the same conclusion that they do eventually come to in the Council of Elrond, that yeah. they need to take it to Mount Doom, I would yeah. assume. Yeah. Which would have been quite a lot easier at this point in history. <laughs> but there we go. It would make uh, as good of a story, you know? No, it would not. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to carry on reading my king said elender kirion is dead and aratan is dying that's the two younger sons yeah your last counselor must advise nay command you as you commanded otar go take your burden and at all costs bring it to the keepers even at the cost of abandoning your men and me 
King's son, said Isilda, I knew that I must do so, but I feared the pain. Nor could I go without your leave. Forgive me and my pride that has brought you to this doom. Elendur kissed him. Go, go now, he said. Isildur turned west, and drawing up the ring that hung in a wallet from a fine chain about his neck, he set it upon his finger with a cry of pain, and was never seen again by any eye upon Middle-earth. But the Elendelmere of the west could not be quenched, and suddenly it blazed forth red and wrathful as a burning star. Men and orcs gave way in fear, and Isilda, drawing a hood over his head, vanished into the night. So the Elendilmir is the star of Elendil, which was yeah. this kind of jewel that he wore on his forehead. Yeah. Um, and so it was, uh, it sort of sounds like what they're in, suggest, what the te text is suggesting here is that it was able to be seen despite him wearing the ring, which was... Is that is that your interpretation of that? Because yeah. it says that he set it upon his finger with a cry of pain and was never seen again. Yeah. And then it says, but the Elendil mirror of the West could not be quenched, which that's cool. Um, yeah, that's cool. But it must be a magical artifact. It must have yeah. some sort of power. Um, yeah. I don't know too much more about it. Um, another one, it was lost, obviously, when Isilda dies in the river. Yeah. But another one is created for his son and it's like one of the tokens of the house of the north mm -hmm. um of the northern kingdom so all of the numenorians were killed the soldiers were killed including isilda's heir elendur the son okay. here who um was said to have been the fairest of the seed of elendil most like to his grandsire um i.e elendil um mm -hmm. so he's he's got the wisdom that his father lacks although i do get a hint of ring temptation from him here like i, I get yeah, the, yeah yeah i get i do get the sense from him in this passage that yeah you know, but then he, in a way he says if he would be really tempted he would say give me the ring hmm. i'll flee or something like that maybe yeah because the ring clearly at this point was conscious and was trying to escape like it mm -hmm. wanted to escape you know golem because it saw his opportunity uh with with bilbo um and i do think at this point the ring was like oh okay this is my chance now i mean he doesn't he doesn't more strongly try to claim the ring like i'm not saying he's trying to claim the ring from his father no. but it's just the sort of reverence that he has for it is noticeable yeah, he and, the, and he thinks about it a lot, right? This is literally all they think of, the bloody ring, not their own lives or anything. It's just about the ring, everything. Mm. Yeah. But then we are told that he's, you know, the fairest of the seed of Elendil and so on. So he overcomes that, which is important. Yeah. yeah. Um, and maybe Isilda is on the verge of doing that too. We never, we, we never know what would have happened if he had reached Rivendell. But, um, but it does, does make you wonder whether Isilda was on a path to redemption here and whether he was mastering his own need for the ring or trying to he was no i said that he was, was too trying powerful. to but yeah but he was too powerful to give up the ring why mm. could bilbo give up the ring because mm. you know he was a hobbit he was super humble he, he you know mm. that was a different story Frodo even at that but then again I do think the Frodo thing is yes he was also a hobbit and all that but the ring was too powerful at that time it's like something switched when, on. when he gets to the cracks of doom yeah, yes so yeah it is different um but I think Isildur and this is what we learn about the ring right is it's also about the bearer the power of the ring is also about the bearer and I think Isildur was too powerful look what we know about him you know he was now the new king of um Arnor all that he was a mm. Numenorean he was one of the faithful his you know he was very a very powerful king he was too powerful to give up the ring I think that is my head cannon. I, yeah, I think, right, yeah, he's definitely, he's too, he's too powerful of a person to hold it as, as the, in the way that Frodo does, you know, as a true yeah. burden where he's just like, yeah, the rings increase the power in according to the measure of the bearer. That's what, yeah. uh, I'm paraphrasing what Galadriel says in the Lord yeah. of the Rings here. So yeah, yeah that, that follows logically. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to finish this reading and then, um, and then we'll talk about it and then we'll close up. Um, so this is the, the end when Isildur dies. He stood for a while, alone and in despair, 
Then in haste he cast off all his weapon, all his armor and weapons, save a short sword at his belt, and plunged into the water. He was a man of strength and endurance that few even of the Dunedain of that age could equal, but he had little hope to gain the other shore. Before he had gone far, he was forced to turn almost north against the current, and strive as he might, he was ever swept down towards the tangles of the Gladden fields. They were nearer than he had thought, and even as he felt the stream slacken and had almost won across, he found himself struggling among great rushes and clinging weeds. There, suddenly, he knew that the ring had gone. By chance, or chance well used, it had left his hand and gone where he could never hope to find it again. At first, so overwhelming was his sense of loss that he struggled no more and would have sunk and drowned. But swift as it had come, the mood passed. The pain had left him. A great burden had been taken away. His feet found the riverbed, and heaving himself up out of the mud, he floundered through the reeds to a marshy islet close to the western shore. There he rose up out of the water, only a mortal man, a small creature lost and abandoned in the wilds of Middle-earth. But to the night-eyed orcs that lurked there on the watch, he loomed up, a monstrous shadow of fear, with a piercing eye like a star. They loosed their poisoned arrows at it and fled. Needlessly, for Isilda unarmed was pierced through heart and throat, and without a cry he fell back into the water. No trace of his body was ever found by elves or men. So passed the first victim of the malice of the masterless ring, Isilda, second king of all the Dunedain, lord of Ardor and Gondor, and in that age of the world, the last. Yeah. And that's the end of Isilda. Bye-bye. And that he doesn't leave a trace is also very telling of Tolkien because you have so many graveyards basically you know you have kings being buried on mountains and these special flowers grow there then a woman buried on an island and you know like mm. very you know it's very symbolic to bury and to leave something behind and a memory behind there's nothing left of him which is very interesting mm -hmm. could be his body washes up on the shores of the Anduin or, you know, like, and they found him and could be, right? Um, yeah, I mean, there's no reason why it wouldn't necessarily. Yeah, yeah. but no, and just, you know, like Fëanor, he went up in flames. There was nothing left of mm. him. Um, it's interesting. And I, I like this part about him looming up like a great shadow yeah. and, the, and the orcs being scared of him. Yeah. Um, and I, I also wonder, like, how... Because, you know, Tolkien always gives us a, a, a metatextual frame, like a kind of frame narrative, a reason that this text, text exists and yeah. where did it come from and all, everything. It, I wonder, like, how, how was this recorded? <laughs> did, did somebody capture the orcs and interrogate them after the fact and then, <laughs> and then write this down? Um, yeah, or, I mean, there was nobody. No, I mean, there was nobody to witness that, right? There was nobody left. Or was this a true omniscient narrator thing that is outside of the normal Tolkien paradigm? Oh, I, it I mean, who's who's always watching in the rivers? There's a Valar, <laughs> maybe. Mm, true, yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, I don't know that we're given... I mean, there, at different parts, there are people who do survive. There's Otar, the squire, so he yeah, but he's gone to, at that he's point. He's gone. He does yeah. make it to Rivendell, obviously, with the Shards of Narsil yeah. and gives them to Elrond and so on. Yeah. And Elrond, Elrond keeps them. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it's definitely somebody retelling something and mm. it's it's not just, and he was dead. It's mm. very important how and and what happened. Um, well, again, I mean, who was present in all the waters? <laughs> we know somebody, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe and he was close to the elves, so maybe he told the Teleri and so the elves of the Falas then learned how it happened. Could be, why not? Yeah, that could work. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know that we're given any details about where that text comes from. Um, I no, could be wrong about it that, weren't but. orcs telling, <laughs> telling that. They wouldn't tell the truth about it, would they? Um, yeah, they would be like, yeah, we killed him right away. No problem. Um, 
but that's so that's the end of Isilda. Um, I I really, as I said at the beginning of the reading through that last part, I um, I really like that text because it gives yeah. us more of an insight into who Isilda mm -hmm. was and his struggle with the ring yeah. for that for those two years, and the the continual reference to hit giving him pain. I find interesting because I feel like the the ring itself is vengeful, and it's trying to punish yeah. him. Um, it's yeah. Sauron's will made manifest, and um, yeah, and so he was the one who took the ring and who finished off Sauron, because mm -hmm. yeah, the spirit might have left the body; the body was dead, but with the ring, still he could have I don't know maybe the his spirit could have taken the we don't know right, but mm. the ring taken away from him weakened him for centuries now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So any any more closing thoughts on on Isilda overall in his journey? No, no. Uh, <laughs> but I like the cat. No, I really like that. I think it's a yeah, like you said, people just think, oh, hmm, he did something wrong. He wasn't. No, he actually contributed a lot to um, somebody later on coming, claiming, reclaiming the throne of Anor and Gondor, reuniting the people. Um, he. He played a part in Aragon later being what he is and who he is. And yeah, I, I find mm. it because Aragon asks himself, he says that, you know, he is from the blood of these people, right? Um, if he, if he can withstand the temptation, right? Um, and do good and do right. Uh, so that is mm. interesting that he refers to his ancestors. Sort Precise. of as a cautionary tale, or, or, yeah. Or, I mean, he's very proud of his heritage, clearly, Aragorn, book Aragorn, anyway. He is, yeah. but he also knows about what, what Arfarazon did. That, that was also mm. a relative in a way of him. That's also his heritage, right? So he knows the Numenorians also effed up many, many times. We're not just mm. the super perfect, you know? So this is why he was so humble. Yeah, I really like this character. I enjoyed this conversation. Um, what do you have coming up on the Clueless Stand Girl, Helen? I don't know when you will drop this video. <laughs> probably, um, as we're recording, probably next week. Okay, um, good. Because I'm going to try and drop the one with Chris this week, and I still yeah. haven't recorded the second part of that, so yeah. I'll just break that up with this one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then hopefully, maybe, uh, if not, uh, check my channel. I have a few super fun interviews coming up with uh, interesting people, and I told you before, so I'll dress up as Luthien, and a very special guest will come as one of the Durin, or whoever um, and uh, we will replay uh, and re and have a good talk and chat about what happened to my daddy uh, because again I'll come as Luthien in uh, full glam and uh, yeah we'll we'll talk about daddy issues now I'm obviously just kidding but we'll talk about Thingol, Thingol. and the dwarves um, and um, yeah then I have um, Matt on uh, from from the Dork Lords and we'll talk about the War of the Rohirrim which I find I'm just reading into the law of Rohan which I love um, and I find mm -hmm. so fascinating so I'll do a video on that and might do a law video also on, on the Rohan I thought because it's so cool and so fascinating like Helm Hammerhand and, and these people mm -hmm. and the ancestors of the Rohirrim um, yeah like Law videos, stuff like that. But you know, I'm I'm always like busy, and I wasn't very well the last weeks, uh, and a bit under the weather. Um, and I hope that will be better soon. And yeah, so more videos to come, hopefully. Okay, good stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I really enjoyed this talk. We haven't done this in forever. Well, it's been a couple of months, maybe. It's not been that yeah. long. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's been good. Um, and you'll have to invite me on soon as well, hopefully. Um, yeah, we'll do something. We'll find a good second age. I, I mainly do second age these days. So what's <laughs> happened to the first age stuff? Hello. Uh, yeah, we'll find something. Cool. Um, and so for me, I, I've, I'm currently working on a um, on a, a video about Galadriel. So I'm talking about her various Surprise. different backstories and her um, all the contradictory information that we have about her and trying to ask the question like who was she because the, the same obviously we hinted about the backlash about the trailer this week which has kind of inspired me to, 
cover this topic because people are questioning whether she should be an armor and whether she should have a sword and everything. She was else. a girl who grew up um, and changed her mind and changed she, who she was. That's... She went through several phases of her life, and I yeah. think there's there's quite good text. We all did. <laughs> We all go through our um, swords and sorcery armor phase where we. No, but I'm not the girl I was with 15 or 16. No. Like I'm a different person now, and that's perfectly fine. And this is. And what that was that to was her. Tolkien's conception of the elves, so that you know yes. people think that they just have these like static lives that they don't. No, well, no, like they just have they're very long lived, and they go through phases of their lives like everybody else. Yeah, and um, they they care for the fate of the world very very much, and if things happen their attitude changes as well. So I can see it both ways. Um, I'm not like setting this up just, just to defend the show, just to like be a shill or something, because that's not what, what? I'm saying at all. But, but I, I do I want to see you is... on Nerdtronic again. We've all been <sighs> there now. <laughs> Nerdtronic. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's what's coming from me. That'll be that'll probably come out before this does actually. Um, after that, I'll be back on to uh, part two of chapter seventeen of the um, the Silmarillion Explained series. So that'll be uh, the week after this. Yeah. Um, and then after that, probably more podcasts. Probably part two of the Elrond podcast with Chris, if I can, if I can tear him away from the Elden Ring for an hour or two. Oh my god, I'm so excited for that. I'm really thinking about getting a PlayStation Five to. Uh -huh just for this game it is so cool and you know the law i mean it's george r. r martin the law he always literally i saw so in the trailer there's a glowing tree looks very much like telperion just saying really i didn't see that yes um and you know he always wanted to write about a glowing tree and a ring of you know a ring of power that's what this man always wanted and he mm -hmm. now has it in a in an epic uh, looking it's, computer the man's game. made a whole career out of talking fan fiction if you ask me yeah <laughs> you know yeah. um yeah so i'm excited for that as well i'm thinking to to get it i haven't didn't have a console for like years now mm. I want to get a gaming pc i actually yeah. want to make some gaming content for the channel i want yeah. to play i want to play um uh, Lord of the Rings Online and make yeah. videos on it for the channel because I think it'll be cool. You can play with Euston. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Um anyway, so that's what's coming from me. Um but that's goodbye from me and goodbye from Helen. So we'll see you all next time. Um Helen's links will all be in the description below as well. So make sure you check that out if you're not familiar with her channel. All right. Bye everybody. <laughs> bye bye. Mwah.